the nucleus, here's this nucleus, and again, you have the same competing forces. You have the strong nuclear force trying to bind everything together, and you have the weak nuclear force trying to pull things apart. Uh, the fact that, I'm sorry, not the weak nuclear force, you have the electromagnetic force that is trying to pull things apart, and a consequence of that is that the binding energy per nucleon is smaller as you um, as the nucleus gets bigger. It becomes less and less tightly bound. Uh, that's true for any element heavier than iron and nickel. The more stuff you add to the nucleus, the less tightly bound the nucleus becomes. It's still bound, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be there, but it's less tightly bound than it would be if it was um, if it was a smaller nucleus. And that's because of, well, in part because of the electromagnetic force that is pulling the nucleons apart from each other because the strong nuclear force is a short range force. And once you get to a nucleus of a certain size, the range of the strong nuclear force is shorter or smaller than the diameter of the nucleus. Anyways, you have this situation where it's ready to go sprawling if only it could be liberated and uh, f from the thing that's binding it together. So if you can somehow get it to break apart, it would release that extra energy. You would, if this were to break apart, you would release two, well, let's pretend that it's two because that's basically what happens. You would release two daughter particles and these daughter particles would have smaller nuclei, which means that they are more tightly bound because we're in this regime where the larger the nucleus is, the less tightly bound it becomes. So any daughter particle that comes out as it breaks apart would be more tightly bound, which means that it's releasing energy and that energy is gonna come out in the form of kinetic energy, basically. So this was discovered, uh, the breaking apart of a nucleus, um, and this is different than the decays. The, and what I said is also true about decays, but decays are typically small, like tiny particles that come out. So the decay of a uranium atom would be a beta emission or a gamma emission or an alpha particle, an alpha emission that comes out. But in this case, when we're breaking it, splitting it in half, we call it fission. So this is different from decays. Nuclear, like radioactive decay is just tiny particles that are coming out, popping out as it works its way down to becoming lead. And fission is when you take this nucleus and you split it into two uh, fairly large fragments. In order to get the fission to take place, um, you have to have the right set of circumstances. One of them is that you have to have a nucleus that can break apart in that manner. Um, that typically means that it's something where it's uh, there's a bit more instability in the nucleus in that um, the quantum states, like the spin states of all the nucleons, are such that it is, is more readily excited by the presence of something else. And in this case, what you do is you would send in a neutron. So here's a neutron. It comes in and it uh, connects with this uh, nucleus. And then that nucleus will become unstable and split apart. The most common elements that are easy to break apart like this. Well, I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit, I guess. When this happens, so you have a neutron coming in, it hits the nucleus, the nucleus splits apart. You're gonna get two daughter particles and you're gonna get some leftover fragments and that's gonna be other neutrons that come out. The number of neutrons that you get coming out depends upon like what it is that you're breaking apart. And it's typically, it's not always the same number. It's gonna be you know around two and a half or so that come out. So sometimes three, sometimes two, sometimes four. It just, um, there's some relative probability of each of these combinations taking place. If we were to look at the nuclei that break apart, uh, let's take a look at this. Coming back here, we'll go to nuclear fission products. There is this famous, famous plot. We'll use this one straight from Wikipedia. Uh, I want it opened up here. Okay, so this shows the byproducts, what happens when you break one of these heavy nuclei apart, and it depends on which nucleus you're talking about. Uh, in this case, there's three different ones that they're looking at, uranium-233, plutonium-239, and uranium-235. So these are three that are easy to break apart. These are the measurements that they made of the daughter particles that come out from the fission process. And on the bottom here, it's not shown, but uh, what, what's going on on the bottom here, this is the number of protons of the daughter particles. So uh, is it the number of protons? No, this is the atomic number of the daughter particles. Okay, so you're seeing here 90, that's gonna be the sum, that 90 is gonna be the sum of the um, protons and the neutrons of the particles that come out. They don't always come out as the same particle, so you'll have, you know, the, here's strontium, here's zirconium, here's technetium, 
Um, over here, you've got cesium that's up here. If we look at the periodic table, uh, we're going to be looking for things that are between, what, 90 and 110, roughly, 85 to 110, or things that are between, you know, say 130 and 150 in the total atomic number. So let me pull up a periodic table. Uh, from 90 to 90 to 100 ish is going to be where? So that's everywhere from ytterbium. Everyone likes ytterbium. It's a great, great element. From ytterbium up through ruthenium or rhodium or palladium. And so that palladium is 106. So ytterbium to palladium ish for the uh, light portion of the daughter particles. So they come in these two packets. They don't split directly in half. They split into these things. I'm not totally sure why this happens. Um, it's just that's the world that we live in. And then the other ones are around 130, 150. So that's going to be what? 130 is up here. Iodine, tellurium, xenon. That's an important one, the xenon, because that's a poison. Um, a poison not to humans, it's actually kind of inert to humans, but it's a poison for a nuclear reactor because it tends to absorb neutrons, uh, but we'll get to that later. So you're looking at tellurium through cesium, barium, and then some of these in the lanthan lanthanum or lanthanide series. Uh, neodymium, um, which is you know another favorite element of people. So there you go. You're going to get one uh, set of daughter particles from this row and another set of daughter particles from up here where it kind of transitions over the edge and up into this area. So xenon, iodine, those are going to be a common um, byproduct. And then you have ytterbium and molybdenum, technetium. Those are good, important things to know about because we use those for uh, different medical purposes and things like that. So thank you for that sub. I appreciate it, Will. And I, it's good to be back. So these are the daughter particles. Notice that it's slightly different for, depending on the element that you choose. If you choose uranium-233 versus plutonium, you get a slightly different mix. Uh, it looks like the high mass end doesn't really change all that much, but the low mass end uh, changes a little bit more. Anyways, uh, another thing that you'll notice uh, going on here is the fact that um, all of these elements, 233, 239, uh, 235, they are all odd numbers. So fission is much more likely to take place when you have odd numbered elements. Um, and that doesn't mean that it can't happen for the even-numbered ones, but it's more likely to happen for the odd-numbered ones. Okay, so this fission, uh, when you break it apart, you are producing the very elements that you need, and in this case are the very building blocks that you need to have another round of fission take place. So you have a single particle here that would like to break, or that's not broken apart, but it will break apart if you add a neutron to the mix. Then it breaks apart. It, fission, it goes through the fission process. You get these daughter particles that come out. We'll ignore those for now, but these neutrons that are right here, those are going to be important. So they're going to be coming out, and they can be the thing that goes in and feeds this process. So it can be this neutron right here has the potential to break another uranium nucleus apart, uh, or thorium, or whatever it happens to be. So um, it's this neutron yield from the fission process, it has to be more than one. Uh, if it's only one, then you won't get a, a sustainable chain reaction because you'll lose some of the neutrons or some of them will be absorbed without causing a fission. And so you need to have enough excess neutrons coming out of this interaction in order to fuel another generation of um, fission events. If you only get one neutron, then the best you can do is, is sustain it one element at a time. If you get several that come out, then you can get uh, an exponential growth in the number of fission uh, processes that take place, and you can uh, ramp up to some large amount of power, you know, like in a bomb or in a nuclear reactor, which are not the same thing. Bombs and nuclear reactors are not the same thing. Uh, so there we go. Now, with these neutrons that come out, so let's consider, let's use uranium-235. Uh, uranium-235 as our um, example element that we're going to go through the uh, that we're going to fission we're going to break apart uh, the reason for this is that then it's easy for me to remember and this is the most common nuclear fuel that we are using right now so uranium-235 that's going to be the thing that we break apart and it's going to spit these things out if we look at the how the uranium absorbs the neutron that would be the fission cross-section so we're going to look at uh, a set of things called cross-sections sections 
And cross sections are basically what is the probability of a neutron being absorbed and some event happening afterwards. Because there are a variety of different kinds of cross sections. You can have a scattering cross section where here's the here's the uranium-235, the neutron comes in and bounces off. You can have the absorption cross section where the neutron comes in, gets absorbed into the nucleus, and then you get uranium-236, and it just stays there and it doesn't break apart. Or you can have the fission cross section where it comes in, hits this thing, and then it breaks apart. So it's the fission cross section that we're going to care about. Um, what's the probability of it absorbing a neutron and then undergoing a fission uh, event shortly after that. So let us take a look at the fission absorption cross-section. I should point out that when these, uh, when fission was first discovered, this was like 1936, I believe, when fission was first discovered uh, by Lee Smitner. Lee Smitner, and I don't know why it spelled it wrong when I, anyways, uh, she was an Austrian physicist. Her parents were Jewish. She had actually converted to Lutheranism, but her parents were Jewish. And this was the 1930s, and it was in Berlin, which is not really the best time to be the descendants of uh, Jewish parents. She was working with Otto Hahn uh, in Berlin, and uh, but she was from Vienna, Austria. Now, what had happened in uh, Germany at this time was the Anschluss, which of course we're all familiar with, the Anschluss which was the annexation of Austria. Okay, it was the annexation of Austria where Austria was joined into Germany, at which point having an Austrian passport no longer meant that you were a foreign resident. So for the up through the mid thirties, uh, Mittner had this Austrian passport, which meant that there would be international uh, disputations if something bad were to happen to her. But then with the Anschluss, now Austria is part of the Third Reich and um, I guess this tells us when it happened, it was 1938. Uh, so that was part of the part of the Third Reich, which meant that her passport was now invalid. And at that point, um, Otto Hahn and, uh, and other collaborators in Germany were like, it's about time for you to get out of the country. And so they sent uh, Mittner on a train. I think that Hahn gave her uh, a ring, it may have been his own wedding ring. Um, to be able to bribe the guards if she needed to at the border between um, Germany and the Netherlands. And so then she went to the Netherlands to Groningen. I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't actually know because I don't speak Dutch. Uh, I want to go to maps, which is fairly close to the German border up in, is this Phrygia? I think this is Phrygia up here in this area. So anyways, from from Berlin across the border over here because she was going to do some work uh, with a bunch of collaborators here who were actually collaborators in a number of ways, including um, smuggling people, sl smuggling scientists out of Germany through Groningen and then dispersing them out to the UK, to the United States, or in her case, up to Stockholm. So she was smuggled there um, and ended up in Stockholm. Her son, I believe, was in Copenhagen. Anyway, so there you go. That was Lee Smitner. They're the ones that discovered this. And basically they said, uh, we have this uh, process that's going on. We're doing a bunch of stuff to it. We have these chemical elements here, uranium, and we're doing a bunch of stuff to it. And there's products that are coming out that we don't recognize. They're acting more like, instead of acting like uh, plutonium, have this uranium instead of thorium or, well, it wouldn't act like plutonium, but taking the uranium, instead of it acting like thorium or actinium or something slightly smaller, they said, I think it was bromine or barium. It was barium. They said, we get something that comes out that acts more like barium. Uh, and that's a big jump to go from uranium to barium. And they said, the only way for that to happen is if this thing actually split. And then uh, the news got around and that's where Einstein wrote his letter that's like, wow, there's a lot of energy that's available to you. You might want to consider uh, starting a project to develop a bomb because if you don't, the Germans will. And, uh, and there you go. There's some history towards that of of that. Okay, nevertheless, that brings us back here. We're going to start with uranium-235, and we want to look at the fission cross-section, so the probability of absorbing an, a, a neutron and then breaking apart afterwards. So here we go. Fission, fission cross-section, uranium-235. Did they know what was going on in the sun at that time? Uh, this is 1930s? No, the sun wasn't really figured out until the 1940s and 50s. Here is the total and fission cross sections. Hmm, that's interesting. I haven't seen this plot before. So this will be instructive to look at. 
we're going to steal this picture, the total and the fission cross sections of uranium-235. The total one is the one that's on, up on top, which makes sense because it has to be higher because the total cross-section has to be larger than the fission cross-section. The fission cross-section is the one down here. That's the one that's important is the fission cross-section. Notice that the cross-section for, and it's a function of neutron energy. So the higher the neutron, the higher the energy of the neutron that comes out of the fission process, or that's not so much coming out of the fission process, but the higher the neutron energy that goes into the fission process. So that's the higher the energy of this neutron right here, it turns out that the less likely it is to be absorbed. It's harder to absorb a neutron at that energy, uh, at super high energies. It's similar to you know how it might be harder to catch a flying bullet or something like that as it goes by. So it's difficult to have a to absorb a neutron that is super high energy. Like this is 10 MeV. Okay, and that's where it's normalized. So this 10 to the zero, 10 to the zero is equal to one. So that's where this whole cross section is normalized. It's probably measured in barns. Yes, it is measured in barns, which is a reference to the broad side of a barn. So one barn is the fission absorption cross section of uranium 235 with the fission products of um, that correspond to these 10 capital MeV neutron energies, which is probably the energy that comes out from the fission process. All right, so that's one barn. Notice if you slow the neutron down, then the probability of getting absorbed goes up. And uh, it goes up quite a bit. Now we'll ignore this stuff right here in the middle for the moment, and we will continue up to here if you're talking about neutron energies of 10 to the minus nine MeV. So that's gonna be what, uh, three milli EV? So if you have, I'm sorry, one milli EV? So one milli EV energies gives you a factor of 10, 100, 1,000, almost 10,000, not quite 10,000 improvement in the fission cross-section. So if you have really slow moving neutrons, really slow moving neutrons, it will hit the nucleus and then you are much more likely to get a fission um, event. <coughs> um, so slowing the neutrons down improves the probability of getting a neutron to absorb. Now, why is this gonna be important? Well, let's suppose that you have a bunch of uranium atoms. So here's a whole bunch of uranium atoms that are ready to um, break apart. These are all uranium 235s and you send in a neutron. Uh, the neutron comes in and it's going to, the probability of it being absorbed is goes down as the higher the energy goes. So if you have, here's your block of uranium and the absorption cross section is too small, then your neutron will just go through the material and not get absorbed at all. So you want to slow the neutrons down so that the probability of it being absorbed goes up and then um, it gets more likely to be absorbed here, which will then break off two or three other neutrons that can go and also have some probability of being absorbed. However, the ones that are gonna come out from this interaction are gonna have very high energies. And so this is something to bear in mind. You're gonna get a bunch of these things, but again, if you're not able to slow them down, they're gonna leave, uh, they're gonna be moving too fast and they won't, the probability of them creating another fission event goes way down. <clears throat> and so you have to, um, well, if you want this to be easy, you want the process to be easy to have a chain reaction of fission events, you need to slow the neutrons down, and we'll get into that momentarily. So slow, uh, slow neutrons means lower temperature, yes. So as you lower the temperature down, which means that the random motions of things are slowing down, then the probability of, being, of absorption goes up. Now, uh, let me take a look real quick, just so that I know, or so that I can remember. The, what is the room temperature? Let's go with uh, 300 Kelvin in electron volts. So this is KT in electron volts. One Kelvin is eight times 10 to the minus five electron volts. So if we go 300 Kelvin, that's room temperature. 300 Kelvin is a 40th, 1 40th of an electron volt, or basically like 0.01, it's 0.025. Okay, so 300 Kelvin is 0.025 electron volts. Let's come back here to the absorption cross section and say if we're able to cool the neutrons down to room temperature, meaning that they would be in thermal equilibrium with a room environment, then it would go from one barn to, that was 10 to the minus two electron volts. This is capital MeV. So 10 to the minus two is gonna be 10 to the minus eight MeV, right? 10 to the minus six MeV is gonna be one electron volt. And then we're looking at 10 to the minus two electron volts, which puts us down here, which puts us an absorption cross section around uh, this area. Okay, which is about just over a factor of 200 more likely. So when you start, when the 
neutrons come out of the fission process, they're going wicked fast. And if you can slow them down to room temperature, then the probability of them being absorbed goes up by a factor of more than 100. So it's almost like as they slow down, the effective size of the other targets that you would want to hit, the other uh, uranium atoms in your network or in your crystal or your structure are going to be 200 times bigger, which, and that's the cross section. And so uh, the absorption probability goes way, way up if you can slow the neutrons down. If you can't slow them down, then you just have to rely, um, you have to get a lot of material there. If there's no way for you to slow the neutrons down, then you have to have a lot of material in the environment in order for the lower probability of an absorption taking place is counteracted by the fact that you have more stuff that can absorb it. So if you want, um, so that will be something that comes up in a moment as well. Let's see. The neutrons in the material are also moving around, so the slower the incoming neutron, the more time it spends in the material, giving a greater chance of colliding. Uh, no, this is the actual absorption cross-section for, um, for a single object. And so it's not the amount of time that it spends there. It's the, you account for the time already in the calculation. It's just the cross-section itself. I'll give you another example of how this comes into be. Um, there, in general, the cross-section of an object, the scattering cross-section, so you have an object and you're gonna bounce something off of it, all of that, in general, does depend on the velocity. So, for example, if you have um, an object here and you send in a light wave that is a really short wavelengths. So the wavelength here is short compared to the size of the object. Um, then you tend to get something that looks like this. So you have light coming up here, you'll have light down here, and then you cast a shadow. On the other hand, if the wavelength gets very long, the longer the wavelength becomes relative to the size of the object that you're scattering, then you end up getting diffraction patterns that come out over here. Um, and the effect of like the cross-sectional the portion of the object that interacts with the wave increases such that uh, if you're looking at water waves for example scattering off of something uh, you the cross-section will change from being pi r squared like this and it will grow as the impact velocity changes the wavelength of the uh, whatever it is that you're probing it with changes it will grow from pi r squared to 4 pi r squared, which is weird. So this is going from the perfect cross-sectional area, which is, you know, like here's a sphere. That perfect cross-sectional area is going to be pi r squared if you slice it directly. And 4 pi r squared is the total surface area of a sphere. So as you hit it with lower and lower energy, which means longer and longer wavelength, as you hit your target with that, then the whole surface area interacts with your wave function. And the scattering... Um, the byproducts of the scattering or the effects of the scattering uh, are related to the whole surface area of the object. So the same thing is going to be true here with these neutrons, that as the neutron gets slower, then the interaction cross-section goes up, <clears throat> and in this case by more than just um, the surface area ratio, it goes up by a lot. Yeah, it does, in a scattering event like that, it does interact all the way around, um, and you get effects off of the whole surface. So in this case, it's, there are other effects that come into a place. It's a velocity-dependent interaction cross-section, um, and that's a common thing. That, that's something that happens all throughout all sorts of particle physics and uh, nuclear physics. Okay, so back to this. We have this cross-section. So if you can't slow the neutrons down, you have to have a lot of stuff nearby because the cross-section is a lot slower. In fact, you have to have about a factor of 100 nearby, right? So if you want the fission cross-section to work when you can't slow the neutrons down, you have to have roughly 100 times the density of material. So again, if we look at, uh, if, where are you? Where's my blue? It's not printing blue anymore. Hold on a second. There we go. Oh, that's what happened. I had the... Okay, so here is... Going back. If you have some substance... So here is... I did it again. I really do want this to be the color. Oh, I have to click OK. OK, there we go. 
<clears throat> so if you have, here's your substance, these are your uranium element or atoms, and you want them to break apart. If you have slow neutrons, then you can have these things spread farther apart. Right? If you have slow neutrons, then you can have uranium atoms that are spread out like this, where the density goes down by, what, the 100 to the 2 thirds power or something like that. Because the cross-section of absorption or of fission is going to go up. But if, you, if the neutrons that are being emitted from here, if you cannot slow them down at all, then you have to concentrate the particles that you're going to break apart. You have to concentrate the uranium. Uh, that way, you compensate for the fact that the fission cross-section goes down with the fact that you just have more opportunities to have a fission event. So you have to, in concentrating this stuff, you reopen the possibility of having a fission event. So this is the reason why you have to enrich the uranium is uh, in order to, to make this happen. So let me, I guess we'll pick up from that point. So these are some of the consequences of, back to here, some of the consequences of this interaction cross-section or the fission cross-section. Okay, so what does this mean? If you want to have the sustained reaction and uh, you're using uranium-235 as your fuel, in the natural environment, uranium-235 is only half a percent. So natural uranium is about 90, what, 99.5 percent uranium-238, which is not uh, uranium-235. And then you have about 5%, 0.5% is uranium-235. I believe this is correct. Let's might as well look it up real quick. Let's see. So I want the relative abundance of uranium isotopes, uh, isotopes of uranium. What do we got? We've got uranium-235 is, it's about half a percent. Okay, so it's 0.7%. And uranium-238 is almost everything else. The rest of it is just trace, like, tiny quantities of everything else. Okay, so you have this uranium-235. We should also look at the cross-section of, fission cross-section of uranium-235, 235, and 238, so we can compare the, be the difference in the behavior between these two um, elements. All right, so let's take a look. It looks like this one shows it. So this shows the cross-section of uranium-235 and uranium-238. It is, uh, it's not a noisy road, it is a noisy airport that is right there next to my office. The flight line is directly over, over my head. So if we look at the, again, this is the fission cross-section right here, and this shows the neutron energy that's coming in. Notice that uranium-233, uranium-235, and plutonium-239, all these odd-numbered things, all the odd-numbered things that showed up on that other graph that is apparently not there anymore. Um, they're all up here. And uranium-238, which is the most common naturally occurring uranium isotope, is way, way, way lower. This is what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight orders of magnitude lower. That's eight orders of magnitude is 100 million. It's 100 million times less likely, 100 million times less likely to absorb neutrons that are slow, uranium-238. So uranium-238, when it comes to absorbing these slow neutrons and fissioning, breaking apart, it basically, it doesn't happen at all. It takes 100 million of these ones to get one of these ones, is the uh, ratio of that absorption cross-section. So when it comes to building a reactor, you can't use, or it's difficult to use, uranium-238. So let's suppose that you want to make a reactor with uranium-235 as your fuel. What do you need to do? Well, the first thing you need to do is have some uranium-235 around that you can break apart. Then you have to have that uranium-235. Uh, so here's your uranium-235. You have to put it in an environment where the neutrons that come out, they come out at high energies. You need to slow the neutrons down. So you need something to slow them down, some way to slow them down. So you need a slowing thing. This is actually... Um, called a moderator, moderator. So a moderator is a substance that takes the fast moving neutrons and slows them down to ambient temperatures. So this will come down to like room temperature basically. It's not room temperature, it's the temperature inside the reactor. Um, so room temperature, in the reactor room it is room temperature. Okay, so you take 
these fast-moving neutrons that come out of the fission process, and somehow you slow them down with a moderator until they come to the ambient room temperature, or in other words, they thermalize. So when you hear someone talk about a thermal, um, like thermal neutrons, you know, you have this thing, you have a moderator, that now you have thermal neutrons. Those are the fast-moving neutrons that have been slowed down by the moderator, and now they are in thermal equilibrium with the temperature of the moderator. So uh, that is the reason when you build a reactor, you need to have, if you want to build a reactor out of uranium-235, you want to have a moderator because that increases the probability of the uranium being absorbed. Another thing that you have to do is you have to increase the density of the uranium-235. Because if you have the uranium-235 uh, and the particles are too far apart, then this is going to produce some neutrons, and those neutrons are just going to leave the reactor, and they're not going to produce another fission event, and so you're, you can't sustain the reaction. It One breaks apart, and then it's dead, and then everything else just sits there as though nothing happened. So you have to bring these things, you have to bring these uranium atoms close enough together so that there's a reasonable probability of them absorbing some of the neutrons that come out of the reactor core. So you have to increase the density of uranium-235. Okay. In other words, you have to take raw uranium ore and you have to enrich, uh, enrich, that's an R, the uranium. So you start with regular uranium ore, which is 99 point something percent, 99.7 percent. Where did it go? 99.7 or 99.3 percent uranium-238 and only 0.7 percent uranium-235. You need to increase the density of the uranium-235 in your sample so that the uranium-235 atoms are close enough together so that you get a regular fission process. So you need to enrich the uranium and you need to moderate the neutrons that come out of the interaction. Now, when uh, what are the ways that you can enrich the uranium? So let's talk about that first. How do you enrich the uranium? Well, the problem that you have with um, when you take isotopes of the same element, which is what isotope means, you have uranium-238 and uranium-235. And let me know if I've already said this stuff before, but I'm going to pretend that I haven't. Uranium-238 and uranium-235 chemically are identical to each other. So these are the same chemistry. There are very, 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 very small differences in the chemistry between these two things. But in general, um, for our purposes, they're the same chemistry. So you can't separate them chemically. If, for example, you have a sample of uranium-238 and uh, it had some, oh, that's a two. If you had uranium-238 and say plutonium-239 and you wanted to separate these things from each other, because that's another process that you might want to do, separating plutonium from uranium, this you can do chemically. So these are different chemical elements and therefore they bond to other things differently. So you can imagine, taking the uranium and binding it to, typically you'll bind it to like fluorine. So you'll get like uranium hexafluoride. Uh, in that case, plutonium has a different number of elements. And so it's gonna have a different number of fluorine atoms that it bind, bonds to. I, fluorine is just F, right? So this should be, just be an F. I don't know, chemistry's, I never, never liked chemistry, so nobody likes chemistry. All right, so but uranium, you'll get uranium hexafluoride or something like that. And that has a different number of fluorine atoms. If you bind it to plutonium, which has a different number of electrons, then you'll get probably what? Plutonium, you have one more electron to go around, so you get F7, something like this. Uh, that would be my guess. Maybe it's F, no, you'd go one, you'd go one the other direction, so it'd be F5. Okay, so these are different, they have different chemical elements, so uh, it's easier to separate them. And for example, this could happen at, under certain conditions where this does not happen. So you could just, uh, take the uranium, mix it with the fluorine, and this might come out at certain temperatures or certain environments where this will precipitate out of a solution that this doesn't. So there's all sorts of means that you turn over to the chemist and you say, here's two different chemical elements, you separate them from each other, and they'll come up with some chemical process that they can do to separate them. Chemical separation is easy to do relative to this separation. You, if you want to separate uranium-238 and uranium-235, then you have to do it physically. You have to separate them because they have, you can't use chemistry to separate them, you have to use physics to separate them. And so that is done through a process called enrichment. Enrichment, which I've already talked about. And typically what you do here is you use a centrifuge. So a centrifuge is, you have this pipe, looks like this. They tend to be tall and skinny. Um, then you 
take the uranium and you add a bunch of fluorine to it so you get uranium i believe it's hexafluoride i could be wrong it might be pent hexafluoride sounds about right um anyways you have uranium he hexafluoride and this is a gas gas you inject that gas into this centrifuge and you spin these centrifuges around wicked fast as they say so here's the centrifuge spinning around wicked fast you have uranium-235 with hexafluoride, which has a slightly different mass, ever so slightly different mass, than uranium-238 hexafluoride. So it's same chemistry, but the mass is slightly different. And the mass is different in three neutrons, three neutrons per molecule. So you get these things spinning fast, and what's going to happen is that the uranium-238 is going to migrate towards the edges. So the uranium-238 will be here, and the uranium-235 will concentrate more in the center. As you spin the centrifuge, the heavy stuff moves to the outside and the light stuff kind of collects in the center. And the amount of separation you get with a single centrifuge operating for a period of time is gonna be like a small fraction of a percent. Like now it's enriched from 0.7% to 0.71%. So it's a tiny amount that changes, probably even less than this. Then what you do is you put a straw in here. So here's your straw and you suck out the gas that's in the center of the centrifuge. You remove this gas and you bring it over and you put it in another centrifuge. So here's another centrifuge here. You pipe it in there and this thing's spinning around and you go from 0.7% to 0.71% and this goes to 0.72%. Okay, and then again, you siphon out the stuff in the center and you pipe it over to another centrifuge and you put it in there and then you go to 0.73% and so forth. And so you do this many, 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 many times until you've enriched the uranium up to the point where it is useful for what you're looking for. So in the case of a nuclear reactor, you're going to raise it from say 0.7% up to about 5%. Uh, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna use 5%. I think most commercial reactors, they, up, they do it up to 3%, but 3%, 3%, 5%, that's basically the commercial reactor regime. If you're gonna make electricity, you're gonna enrich it up to about 5%. If you wanted to make a bomb, um, and then what you need to do, if you're going to make a bomb, then you need to have the uranium, because a bomb does not have a moderator, you don't have enough room to pack a moderator into a bomb. Then you have to enrich the uranium up to the point where the density of uranium-235 is really high. So the higher the density of uranium-235, because it has a lower absorption cross-section, because you're no longer moderating the neutrons, you have to have a high density. And so you're not going to stop at 5%. You're going to go to like 90%. So weapons grade plutonium or weapons grade uranium is going to be enriched to 90% uranium-235. That's a huge, huge difference. And the reason is now, now you have all this uranium-235 concentrated. And so when the um, events, when one of them breaks apart, uh, it has, while the individual fission cross-section of each atom is small, there are a lot of atoms. You increase the number of atoms by almost a factor of 100 which means that you can get a sustained nuclear reaction. Actually, it's not even sustained. It's a runaway nuclear reaction. So you increase the density to compensate for the fact that the cross-section is lower. So to make a weapon, you have to enrich not to 5%. You have to enrich to 90% or so. So that means that when you make commercial nuclear fuel, and this is expensive. It's already expensive enough. Like This is probably one of the most expensive parts of the whole process is to produce 5% enrichment. No commercial reactor is going to go, or like commercial fuel, nuclear fuel entity is going to enrich to 90% if they don't have to, because you're doing it one step at a time like this, that doesn't change. And uh, the, anyways, that, this is why it takes billions of dollars and a, a nation state to build a nuclear bomb. This is the cheap version of a nuclear bomb because it's the technology that goes into it is fairly low. The learning curve to do it is fairly low but the process is long and um, expensive because it takes so long. Um, you, you've, yeah, you pull the less dense gas out and then um, put it into another one and you go through several steps. So if we look at uranium enrichment plant, uh, if we look at uranium enrichment, you'll see several cylinders of these centrifuges. So here are the centrifuges and they're just lined up and it just siphons one to the next to the next to the next and you slowly, slowly, slowly increase the density of uranium-235 relative to uranium-238. The uranium-238 you just take out, you remove the fluorine from it and now you've got depleted uranium 
which is ever so slightly, ever tiny so slightly, more dense than regular uranium. So regular uranium is a, a tiny mixture. Well, it's mostly uranium-238 with a little bit of uranium-235 added to it that decreases the density. And then you remove the uranium-235 because you have to concentrate the uranium-235 and you have to concentrate it by a factor of 10. Um, but you're removing like less than a percent of the original uranium and now you have depleted uranium which is almost identical to the original uranium in terms of its density but you have to have a use for it and so you make you know bullets out of it how do you test to see your current ratio of uranium during the process well i suspect that during the process they know you know they've measured how along the way what the enrichment is at each step how much you gain with each step and so it's just a matter of, well, this is how much it changes, the enrichment changes from one step to the next. And so that's how many steps you need to make in order to get it up to where, what you're looking for. And then you run it through and then every once in a while you would test your sample. How would you test your sample? Um, you probably, you might have a, I, I could imagine, I don't actually do this for a living, so I can't say directly, but I could imagine having um, a small reactor that's there or you have a, a neutron source. So you have a, a you know, some kind of radioactive element or some ex particle accelerator that gives you a neutron source and then you hit it with the neutron source and you see what kind of energy comes out. Um, so there's all sorts of ways to doing, to doing it. Yes, all of these things are spinning. There's probably an exterior cylinder and then an interior cylinder. I don't know, you know, they have to keep them concentric um, so that it doesn't wobble. If it starts to shake, then you can imagine because these things are spinning pretty fast in order to get this to work. But that's what they look like. Uh, it looked like there was another um, image uh, showing a person standing next to the centrifuges. There you go. There's some people standing next to the centrifuges. Um, different locations, how they, that's what they look like. So now we know what uranium enrichment looks like up close and personal. Um, here is an example. Here's a cross section from the NRC. That's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States. Uh, that's not it. Is this it? Yeah, so this is what the inside of these centrifuges look like. You have this outer chamber. You feed in the uranium hexafluoride, and then um, the depleted uranium, depleted uranium-235 is left over on the edges, and then you siphon out from the middle. Um, okay, how does this look? So it looks like it's there's some kind of circulation pattern in here um, as it gets injected in, and then you're siphoning out this and fraction that's enriched in uranium-235. So that's what these things look like in cross-section. Okay, so that is how you build your nuclear fuel. So now you have a fuel that's enriched in uranium-235 and it's ready to go into your nuclear reactor. However, you still need to have a moderator in order to take advantage of the increased cross-section that you get. And so if you want to slow something down, uh, let me give you a, a couple scenarios. You could Imagine you have a bowling ball and you want to slow it down. Here's your bowling ball. You want to slow it down by hitting it with ping pong balls. So here's a bunch of ping pong balls that bounce off of it. What's going to happen to, if you look at the conservation of momentum in these kinds of collisions, what's going to happen if you have an elastic collision is the ping pong balls are going to come in, they're going to hit this and they're going to bounce off and hardly anything is going to happen to the bowling ball. The bowling ball is going to have basically no difference at all. And so if you want to slow down a neutron, which is the smallest nuclear particle that you can have, I mean, maybe a proton, but we're not talking about protons. Protons and neutrons are essentially the same. So you have this small particle, and it's right now surrounded by uranium-238 and 235, um, mostly still uranium-238. Remember that it's only 5% uranium-235. You have these things come in. The momentum is not gonna be transferred. The energy is gonna be stay with the neutrons. It's gonna bounce off of this and it will still come off with almost identical energy that you had before. The number of collisions that you have to happen in order to bring this into thermal equilibrium with something that's 200 times the mass is probably something like 200 times 200 collisions. It's going to share a small amount each time. So instead what you want to do if you want to bring this down quickly to ambient temperature is you want to have it run into, here's your neutron coming in, you want to have it run into particles that are similar in size. So you might not be able to get everything exactly the same size, but you could have this, I mean, you could imagine having a, a slightly larger nucleus, something like this. So they're much more comparable. The more comparable in size your neutron is to the particles you want to use as your moderator, the more efficiently you will moderate the neutrons, the less bounces they have to have in order to come into thermal equilibrium and then as a consequence, slow down to where they can be readily absorbed by the nearby fuel.
So the best thing that you could have to moderate the neutrons would be another neutron or a proton. So neutrons and protons would make a very, very good moderator. So if you could have, you know, it needs to be dense enough so that you get a lot of collisions. Um, so a gas won't, won't work, but you could have a fluid that would work. Um, other things would be light elements. So this would be like, um, like lithium would work really well. Uh, you could have boron or carbon, and this is pretty common. You could also have oxygen, um, and there's nitrogen in here. So these are some options that are good. These ones in particular are abundant. Carbon and oxygen are among the most abundant elements that we have in the Earth's crust, well, that we have available to us. Certainly oxygen is uh, pretty abundant. <coughs> and carbon's about half. Well, the Earth is slightly depleted in carbon, so that's a, anyways, we won't go into that. But there's a lot of oxygen, a lot of carbon around. There's quite a bit of nitrogen around. So one of the things you can use as a moderator is water. Okay, it's got this light element, oxygen, which is already a decent moderator in its own right. But then you have these hydrogen atoms that are just protons. And so those are perfect moderators. That, that's the best you can get is a moderator that's equal in mass. So you have um, protons in there. You could imagine, and there are some reactors that do this, that use D2O which is deuterium, so this is heavy water, because the deuterium has a, a proton and a neutron. Okay, so it's a hydrogen atom with a proton and a neutron. Um, but this is used, when you do a heavy water um, reactor like this, you're actually not using the deuterium as extra moderation, you're actually using the deuterium as an extra source of neutrons. So we'll get into that um, at a later time. So we'll worry about deuterium moderated stuff later, but it actually uses this as an extra neutron. So now instead of having three neutrons that come out of the interaction, you're going to get three plus whatever extra neutrons you get from these collisions um, that take place. So anyways, water is by far the most common moderator worldwide. It's used in the United States. It's used everywhere else in the world. So that's this is the most common is water because it's abundant and plentiful and which is the same thing. Carbon, on the other hand, this is also something that you can use as a moderator. Uh, the challenge with carbon, um, well, so you have like graphite, for example, can be a good moderator. It's slightly bigger than hydrogen, you know, by a factor of 12 or like a factor of 10. So it's got 10 times the mass. And so it's not as good of a moderator as hydrogen is. However, you don't have these oxygens around. And so in the end, it's basically, um, comparable in the its moderating capabilities and it's also fairly easy to have the first sustained chain reaction used carbon as a moderator so they had this pile it was the chicago pile they had these stacks of uranium um, in this area and then they had blocks of carbon like graphite that were also interleaved in there to act as the moderator so typically what will happen when you design your uh, nuclear reactor is you will have your fuel you'll insert your fuel into what are called fuel rods and it will be a pellet so you'll have a pellet that's roughly the size of a tootsie roll so it's about yay big um, and it's a ceramic that has the uranium fuel embedded in it so you have uranium 235 plus 238 um, it's 95% this and it's 5% this roughly um, it's embedded in the ceramic and then you insert that into these fuel rods and so here's the fuel rod filled with these fuel pellets then you insert several of these fuel rods down into a reactor core so now you have a vessel a large vessel filled with these fuel rods like this and then you fill the vessel with the moderator so you fill it in this case with water so you have water here and that is your moderator so a fission takes place in one of these fuel rods neutrons come out and the neutrons interact with the water slowing down from very high energy neutrons that are hard to absorb to slower moving neutrons that are easy to absorb and then it will pass into another fuel rod and interact with the uranium in there like this one will come over here interact there um, you typically won't get a neutron i mean you might have a neutron bounce off of something and then come back into this area but eventually you're going to get neutrons just flying around you have a neutron rich environment with all these neutrons flying around being moderated down to the temperature of the water um, with, that makes it so that they're easier to absorb and then you have a you know that creates another fission event which creates more neutrons and so you have uh, a sustained reaction because the amount of neutrons that you're producing are slowed down to the point where the density of the fuel is sufficient to 
allow the reaction to take place continuously. Okay, I can't get a sense, here's a question, I can't get a sense of scale of the amount of neutrons and the amount of moderators. Wouldn't any single bump uh, be unlikely so you need a lot of moderation? Yeah, so uh, one single bump isn't enough, but it's typically, um, I, I don't know that, it, you know, like what fraction of the volume, the fraction of the volume taken up by the moderator compared to the fuel rods is probably, um, I don't know, maybe 10 to 1, something like that. If we look at, let's look inside a nuclear reactor core. Uh, now, often the whole environment with the water is bigger than the environment around the fuel rods themselves. You know, this actually shows that it's pretty full, that it doesn't really take that much moderation. Um, because if it does, if you do have a, I guess that makes sense, because if you do have a neutron that comes out of here, bumps off of something and doesn't slow down enough, it's just going to bounce off of the uranium that's in the environment and then come back in. So like the neutrons aren't just moving in a straight line, they're bumping into things all along the way. Uh, here's another example, like looking into a reactor core. So th this doesn't look like it's full yet. It looks like they're still placing elements in there. There you go. So there's that shows where the fuel rods are located in this vessel. So that's kind of cool. Uh, let's see, here's a question. I was wondering, could it also be separated by charging it positively then pull out the lighter stuff with a negative charge? So in other words, another question is, could you just um, do the separation, the enrichment of the uranium by ionizing it first and then using like a mass spectrometer to do that? Um, I suspect the answer is yes. It's probably more expensive to do it that way. It, it's just cheaper to mix the fluorine in and then run through a series of, of these events rather than having something that's capable of ionizing it. Because um, in order to ionize something, you have to have a fair amount of energy. Um, and the whole point of this is to get more energy out of the system than you're putting in. And so it's probably just the centrifuges is probably what's economically feasible, which means it's the most efficient way or among the more efficient ways. Okay, uh, there was a comment about the color of the core. That inside a nuclear reactor core, you have uh, charge particles that are coming out of these things as well. So you bump into stuff, you get decays of things that are going to produce. Um, typically what you'll get is you'll the daughter particles that you produce. So you have a fission event, you have the uranium-235 split into these daughter particles. The daughter particles will go through beta emission in order to get down to the valley floor on the valley of stability. The beta emission comes out and those are going to be high energy electrons. Those high energy electrons are going to be moving at something like 0.8 C, like 80% the speed of light, which is faster than light in the water. So the speed of light in water is about 0.75 C. And so light is moving at three quarters the speed of light. And is, is that right? 0.3, yeah, three quarters the speed of light. And you have electrons that are coming out, charged particles that are coming out moving at 0.8, like 80% the speed of light. And so they're moving faster than the light is. And a consequence of that is you get a Cherenkov cone. You get Basically, it's almost like a shock wave. Uh, you have a burst of light that comes out, and the wavelength of that light kind of depends upon the energy of the particles that are coming out. Um, and so in the case of a nuclear reactor, you get this Trankov radiation that glows blue inside the reactor. So uh, this is a, it's not a consequence of the, well, okay, so fundamentally it is a consequence of the radioactive decays that are going on, but it's from the electrons moving faster than the speed of light and producing this Trankov radiation. Okay, let's see, here's a question. I thought because the neutrons are so small, the bumps would be a lot rarer. How close do they need to touch? Um, well, it's, so the cross sections are not the physical cross sections, right? It's the interaction cross section, uh, which is not necessarily the geometric cross section. But for one thing, these are quantum particles, and so they don't have really a geometric cross section. They have interaction cross sections. Um, and so as they bump into things, you know, water is pretty dense. It's all made out of whatever the density of the water is, it's all protons for the most part. Uh, protons and neutrons and so the probability of bumping into stuff is pretty high when you have a condensed matter if it was gas then the probability goes down but because it's a liquid there's a lot of stuff around uh, wasn't that about absorption so the scattering cross-section and the absorption cross-section are yes as was mentioned in the chat so there's scattering cross-section there's absorption cross-section there's um, fission cross-section all of these different probabilities of interactions taking place and so you can calculate which one is which, or you can measure which one is which in a laboratory, and then use that to help design your reactors. Okay. 
All right, so that is the basics of a reactor design. So if you want to build a nuclear reactor, you need to have your fuel, enriched fuel, uh, and well, that's enriched fuel up to about 5%. It's typically a little bit less than this. You need to have a moderator that's mostly water, uh, but you can use graphite. There is discussions about making something called a liquid sodium reactor. So sodium, if we come to the periodic table, sodium is right here, um, which is, you know, it's heavier than carbon, but it's not, it's not uranium. Uh, so having a liquid sodium, the advantage that you have with sodium, for example, uh, uh, I guess we'll talk about that. So a challenge that you face when you're using water as your moderator is that water boils. And once the water boils, now it's a gas, and now it's a lot more diffuse. And as a con because it's more diffuse, then it's no longer a good moderator because the protons are too spread apart. Graphite has the advantage that it's um, a solid. And so it, it doesn't have the prop, the probability of it turning into a gas is basically zero. It's not gonna immediately vaporize. Uh, water can vaporize. And so that limits the temperature that you can have in your reactor core um, with the water. And we'll get into reactor design. I won't be able to do it today, but we'll do it next time. We'll get go more into detail about reactor design. So the water is gonna be there as the moderator, but that limits the maximum temperature. So if you go to graphite, you can go to higher temperatures. Uh, if you go to sodium, then you can go, uh, the, I guess the challenge that you have with graphite is that it's a solid and not a liquid. And therefore it's, you know, there might be other things that you wanna do. You might wanna use the properties of a liquid to help you know, regulate the temperature inside the reactor because you're gonna get convection cells or whatever. And if you have a solid, then you're not gonna get convection cells inside of a solid. And so the idea of going to sodium is that sodium, you can have a liquid sodium. And liquid sodium then will give you convection and so forth, but it doesn't boil. And so you don't have to worry about the phase transition. So there are a variety of different things you can use for moderators and a variety of different reasons why you would want one moderator over another. So one advantage, well, anyway, so that's uh, the reason that we use different things. Most of the reactors that are designed in the United States and other, well, everywhere basically outside of Russia, it are moderated with water. Russia does have some plants that are moderated with graphite. Okay, and then you have, uh, the last thing that you need to have in here is uh, control. You have to have the ability to control the reaction and to turn it off. And so the way that you do that is you have, uh, you have your fuel rods that are in here. So here's one fuel rod, here's another fuel rod. And then you put in an absorbing, a neutron absorbing material. So here is a neutron absorbing material. It's not the same, it's not nuclear fuel. It's something that, you know, if it gains another neutron in the nucleus, it's happier. And so you, then you can insert this down in here because down in here you have your moderator and you have these neutrons that are all flying around and you're hoping as the interaction is going on, you're hoping that they interact to, with the fission cross section to allow the, the process to continue. But if you want to turn it off, then you want to insert something that's going to absorb the neutrons. It removes the neutrons from the environment and then there's nothing to absorb. And so the fission process shuts down. So you want to have control rods that you can insert and remove from the reactor. If you remove them from the reactor, then the reactor picks back up because the neutrons are going around and they're moderated and everything's working. Or you can stick the control rods back in and then it absorbs the neutron. Now there's no more neutrons around and so you get no more fission events. So these are the three things you need, the fuel, the moderator, and the control rods. Uh, I guess there's one other thing that you need. Uh, I This was actually what I meant to put here, but I couldn't remember what it was until it was too late. Uh, another thing that you want to have is what's called the coolant. Okay, so the control rods are just to be able to manage the interaction. The coolant is another thing that is important to have the reaction take place um, and to operate the way that you want it to. In, in particular, you don't want the reactor to get so hot that it melts the fuel melts through the walls of the fuel rods. So the fuel rods are just made out of some kind of metal. And if it gets too hot, then the fuel will melt the rods and then you can't contain it anymore. So it's harder to control when it's filled up, when your fuel is just floating around inside the, the moderator or your fuel is coagulating at the bottom and you can't get the neutron absorbing material between the, the different fuel rods. So you don't want your uh, fuel rods to melt because that would be a meltdown. And, um, and so you need to be able to cool your reactor. The coolant is a fluid that you circulate in the environment 
so somehow you extract the heat from the reactor environment. Okay, typically this coolant is going to be water again. Okay, so you have in most reactors in the United States and around the world, you have water acting as your moderator and you have water reacting as your coolant. You can have uh, graphite acting as your moderator and sodium acting as your coolant. You can have uh, water acting as your moderator and you know something else acting as your coolant. You have graphite acting as your moderator and water acting, acting as your coolant. So they don't have to be the same thing. They can be different stuff, but they can also be the same thing. So there are a number of reactors that specifically use the same water as their moderator as they use for their coolant. So they extract the heat from the very water that's being used as the moderator. Now, for the case of the United States, this isn't as common. Uh, they do have some. Um, those are called boiling water reactors, where it's the water that is actively being used as the moderator that is also actively being used as the coolant. If not, you can have them in separate loops. So you have a reactor that looks like this. Here's your reactor core. You have all this stuff in it. You fill it with water. That's your moderator. And then you pipe other water into here and back out. And this is your coolant. So you just exchange the heat with water that is in a separate loop that doesn't physically come into contact with the water that's in here. You just run it through here to heat the water up to go run your power plant, for example. Okay, so that's this would be a pressurized water reactor. Um, and we'll come back into why that would be the case in the future, why you'd want to do that. But in this case, the water that's acting as the moderator is separate from the water that's acting as the coolant. Or you can have a boiling water reactor where it's the water that's um, acting as the moderator that is also acting as the coolant at the same time. Okay, you can do that with water, you can't really do it with graphite. Okay, let me um, answer a few last questions and then that will wrap it up for today. And what, I will, what we'll start with next time is we will go on to um, more details in the design of these reactors. And um, yeah, that's what we'll do. So we'll continue on with pressurized water, boiling water reactors, and then we'll move on to other types of reactors that are out there. Okay, here are some questions. Let's see. I didn't know that graphite moderator was a consumable. I didn't. I don't know if it's a consumable either. Like I don't think you use up the graphite, but you probably activate it. You probably make it radioactive um, by adding. You know, you're adding neutrons to the mix. Some of them are going to be absorbed, for example. But I don't think that really the graphite is the issue. Um, we haven't talked about what happens to the nuclear fuel after it gets spent. We'll get to that probably in a week or so. All 12 UK reactors are graphite moderated. Oh, I didn't realize that. So the UK has all graphite moderated reactors. That's interesting. So I believe that the French have primarily boiling water reactors. Um, I could be wrong about that. But so what the French did is they made all their reactors are kind of the same style, um, which is different than the United States. The United States is like everybody wants their own special reactor, and so they're all different. 10,000 tons of waste irradiated graphite sitting around, or 100,000 tons. How big is 100,000 tons? That doesn't sound like it's that much, though. So if you have 100,000, so that would be considered probably um, low-level waste. I don't think that would be considered high-level waste. Um, there's different kinds of, there are different classifications of waste that comes out of nuclear energy production. But you have 100,000 tons. So you have 12 grams per cubic centimeter, roughly. Is that right? No, that's a bit much. So graphite's probably, what, five grams, three grams per cubic centimeter. And so that means it's 3,000 kilograms. So that's three tons per cubic meter. Three tons per cubic meter, and you have 100,000 tons. And so you divide that by three, and you get, uh, what, 30,000 cubic meters? which is 100 cubic meters on a side, something like that. Less than 100 cubic meters on a side. So it's 100 meters by 100 meters by 30 meters. Uh, run until the underground problem solved. How do you get the coolant water to boil if you don't want the moderated water to boil? Um, OK, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I haven't talked about this, but it, we will go into detail about it next time. The pressurized water reactor, how you get the coolant water to not boil is that you have to pressurize it. Uh, I'm sorry, not the, but the, I apologize. If you don't want the water to boil in any of these loops, then you need to pressurize the water because that raises the boiling point. And so if you have a pressurized water reactor, you pressurize the reactor core. So this is all on, in high pressure. And then you run a low pressure water through the system in order to heat it up. 
And so that's the advantage of a pressurized water reactor. The disadvantage of the pressurized water reactor is that you have to have this heat exchanger in it. The boiling water reactor just uses the same thing and you just operate it kind of like right at the, um, you still have to pressurize the vessel because it operates at higher temperatures um, because it makes the process more efficient to operate at higher temperatures. But it, ev everything has to be pressurized to some extent. Um, the question is how much pressurized it will it be? And for a pressurized water reactor, the pressure is quite a bit higher. With a boiling water reactor, the pressure is a bit lower, um, but they are less efficient, easier to build, less complicated, you know, it's got less parts in it, but slightly less efficient. Uh, cobalt 60 is extremely dangerous, huge problem with graphite. So how do you get cobalt 60? Um, 100,000 dairy cows, there you go. So uh, cobalt 60, it's gotta be, it must be because there's cobalt, this residual cobalt in the, um, yeah, impurities in the graphite to begin with. So like when you're mining the carbon, there's gonna be some cobalt embedded in it for some, or some reason like that. And then the cobalt 60 can be activated. Cobalt 60 probably has a fairly short half-life. Let's take a look real quick to see what is the half-life. Half-life of cobalt 60, five years. So, um, and this is something that we'll get to when we talk about radioactive waste. Uh, with a half-life of five years means that you have this source of stuff um, you have a bunch of cobalt 60 that's been activated because of the neutrons in the environment. It probably started as like cobalt 59 or something like that. And then um, you have to wait for five years probably isn't long enough, but you could wait for 10 years and then the radioactivity would drop down by a factor of four. Um, 15 years now is down by a factor of eight. And so um, you wait around for a period of time and now the stuff is fall below, falls below some threshold in terms of the activity, like the amount of radiation that you're exposed to. And then you can do with it what you want. You can build houses out of it. Um, yeah, so it's got a short half-life, which means it's dangerous for a short period of time. If it's got a super long half-life, then it's dangerous for, well, if it's got a super long half-life, then it's not dangerous. And so we will talk about that when we talk about um, what the byproducts are, the nuclear waste, uh, we'll get into the details about like, what does it mean for, how, how do you treat the different waste? And is the waste all the same everywhere? And the answer is no. So that will be interesting. We'll probably get to the waste stuff in about uh, three to four streams from now. So the next stream, we will talk about the design of boiling water and like the, the different kinds of reactors. We'll finish the reactor design. So far, what we've done is just covered like what are the elements that need to go into it. And now we'll go into how do you design the reactor and why do you want a reactor to operate in a certain way? So there we go. Um, anyways, I appreciate everybody's time. I hope that this was interesting. I will be back on Thursday to continue this discussion about designing nuclear reactors. Um, and that's where we'll pick up. Thanks again, everybody. I appreciate it. And let's see, boiling water reactors, you're managing the voiding, the boiling point very carefully. Cooling water enters the core from the bottom and rises um, and not boiling until it reaches the top and lets off steam into a steam chest of some kind. So there we go. We'll take a look at these um, as you know, each of these different reactor designs as time goes on. And then we'll also look at the next generation of reactors and how that all works. So we got a few, we probably got six weeks to a month of material, well, a month to six weeks of material um, coming up. So thanks again, everybody. I appreciate it.